Hello. Oh, you're looking for Nathan East? Well, that's me. Oh, the base tails. Come on, I got you. Welcome, by the way. Honey, I'm home. This was my kind of first real session bass in L.A. that I played on everything from, you know, uh, Randy Newman, I Love L.A. We love it! <laughs> you know, and, uh, but in particular, there's a song on a Hubert Laws album called Family that really lets you know what these basses sound like. It like a lot of character of the bass. By the way, um, this was in my cartridge company and they would bring it to the sessions and I, and I would play it and then just leave. And when the cartridge company changed locations, this bass went missing and it went missing for about 35 years and I literally just got it back a couple of months ago. It's just great to kind of get my hands on this thing again and just uh, fool around. It has a lovely sound there. There's a lot of memories, but this is one of the bases I used um, in the studio with Barry White. And I have, you know, Barry White and Love Unlimited Orchestra. And um, it's it's almost like to, to get it back in my hands again after all these years is just taking me back to so many days um, where, you know, I was just in the studio all day recording. I always say I went to to BWU, Barry White University, because he used to come over and just kind of sing bass lines to you, and he would, he would say, yeah, come on, Nate, just play, dude. And then, he'd, yeah, they, then one part would just be. And so, like, you'd sit there all day. Then you go around down the line and give the guitar players there, you know, Wah Wah, Ray Parker Jr., Lee Rittenauer, all these guys were on these sessions. Ed Green playing drums, and, and Barry would sing the parts to everybody. And then Gene Page would kind of be, be in there writing charts. And, uh, and all of a sudden you would just, you would see from zero to this, this hit being built. And um, it was one of the most amazing things ever. So I learned a lot about creating bass lines from Barry White, believe it or not. I remember the first album I played on, I, I got it home, I cracked it open, pulled out the sleeve and I'm gone. Hey, produced by Barry White, arranged by Barry White, album, concept, all songs written, and there were no musicians' names on the record. And I, and I was gonna, you know, I asked Jim Page, what, what's the deal, you know? It's like, I wanted to tell everybody I played on this record. And he said, oh no, baby, he, he, uh, he doesn't want anybody to steal his sound, so he doesn't put his, the names on the record, so. Um, Nevertheless, at age 16, as a kid playing in Madison Square Garden with Barry White and the Love Unlimited Orchestra with a tux on, um, you know, that's kind of one of the things that I said, you know, I think I want to do this. You know, so uh, it was amazing, amazing experience. So this is the Yamaha BB3000 from the early 80s. And this is the Footloose bass, basically. So, so uh, I'll never forget, we were on the road and we rehearsed that song almost every single day. But the good news is when we went to record it, it was just one take and uh, it was song of the year at the Grammys. And the string spacing was a little tight for me and that's when we started working on the, um, the signature bass, but um, Otherwise, lots, lots of fun sessions with this bass. This is the, um, this is the unplugged bass, MTV Unplugged, um, with Eric Clapton and, and I mean, uh, who can forget the tears in heaven.
was a fun show because it was it was truly unplugged. I mean, a lot of people plug instruments in, but Eric was Eric was um, adamant about the fact that if we're going to do an unplugged show and call it unplugged, everything needs to be unplugged. So I played this and uh, my upright, and it was truly unplugged. And and we didn't know that you know 30 million albums later, <laughs> the world would just it, it took two and a half hours to make that record. We were at Bray Studios out in London. Uh, outside of London, and um, I'll never forget just the the feeling of of just uh, you know doing something that literally only took a few hours in the afternoon and having such a big impact on the world. But uh, obviously, songs like Tears in Heaven um, touched everybody's hearts. So, yeah. <laughs> TRB six string, <coughs> six string bass, and it has the EQ in there, similar to my signature bass. <laughs> this is the bass I used on the very first four play album to do the solos, like 101 Eastbound and and some of those songs. <laughs> because of the six string, and I wanted to get all those beautiful little high notes in there. But uh, probably the the most important recent story about this bass is, and it's fairly heavy, but I was in Switzerland on stage with Toto playing. And we were, we were on, I think the last, next to the last song. Um, and it was, a, it was a double bill with Earth, Wind and & Fire and Toto in this beautiful outdoor setting, probably about 30,000 people um, gathered around. And so, when we were playing our set, Verdi and White was in the front row. And of course, him being one of my biggest influences, you know, I start trying to show off for him. So I start running in place with this bass. And I'm doing this big high step thing because, you know, I'm trying to let Verdi know that he's the man. And, and I'm doing all this and I'm playing. And all of a sudden, it feels like the stage goes out from under me. And, I, and I'm playing. And I look down. And I'm going like this. What's going on? And then. I, something felt wrong, and what had happened is I snapped my Achilles tendon, and so, and, and it was like a bang, and, and so I didn't know, and all of a sudden my ankles hit, but still, I'm playing, I'm just killing it, and ended up playing, and then we did one more song, I went off the stage, and I'm going, why is it hurt? And so, I had torn my Achilles while trying to show off for Verdine White with this heavy bass. Remind me not to do that anymore. Now this bass is, uh, the story behind this is actually uh, an interesting one. It was kind of out of necessity. I was called by uh, Chick Corea to, to sub for John Patitucci in the electric band. And that material, as we know, is <laughs> it's not just right under your fingers. Um, so having gotten the call, I went to Yamaha and I said, uh, and they don't make a, a silent bass yet, you know, for um, like they have a silent guitar that pulls apart and goes into a, um, a little small case you take on the plane with you. So I said, I'm going to need something that I can practice on the plane, you know, for that 11 hour ride. I think our first gig was in in Indonesia. So um, we talk, talked about something that I could practice, a six string, it'll give me those high notes. John Patitucci, six string, got a match, you get it, <laughs> you know, all those tunes. And um, so we started thinking about, you know, what, what would that look like? It would be headless so that I can guarantee, because 50% of the time I'm with my bass over the shoulder, they say, oh, you can't take that on the plane. You can't take it. No, but I have to, you can't put it underneath. So we said, let's go headless, and then that'll 
That'll ensure us uh, a seat on the plane. And then the other one, the this part comes off and goes in a little tiny case. And then we started saying, well, maybe for the sound sake, we wanna we wanna make it um, connected. So it's kind of like a little handle. So we connected it and put kind of the similar electronics that are in my signature bass. I've never been denied a seat on the plane axis. It goes over the in the overhead compartment. It's light. This is actually the prototype for this instrument. And earlier in the year, I was carrying it around um, at the NAMM show. Let me see if I can find a little um, tape. Or, but it's just, the story is, I was at the NAMM show and I was um, I went over to the Genelec booth to to plug in, check out their speakers, which I have at my studio. And uh, I was playing Sir Duke to my track. Um, and as I'm playing Sir Duke, who walks up and strolls up except Stevie Wonder? <laughs> and, and I'm going, you couldn't orchestrate this if you, if you called and said, meet me at 5.40 p.m. Um, and the, the show was just about over. It was a Sunday, um, it was literally just the last few minutes of the show, so I plugged my phone in. You know, I had the track of Sir Duke plugged it into this beautiful sign of speakers to start playing along, and Stevie shows up while I'm playing it. So, like, I'm sitting there playing and talking, hey, how you doing, man? <laughs> talking to him at the same time. <laughs> I just want to say thanks, Scott, for the invitation to do this. Uh, for the bass community in general, I think you've done a fantastic job bringing the world together uh, via the bass. Thanks, everybody, for joining. See you around campus. <laughs> <laughs>